That's Economics 101. Demand remains high and supply is low, so prices are up for basic things that people either want or need. Now the Federal Reserve is getting aggressive to force the market to lower those prices. The Michigan man allegedly behind that sinister plan has been arrested, and according to an affidavit, Neil Walter allegedly said in a November 3rd voicemail, you're going to die, John. That message is yet another recent threat against a lawmaker. And law enforcement agencies say that there has been a significant rise in hate-filled messages directed at American politicians. Since the polls just closed, we'll have a few more minutes here before a first look at the results. In the meantime, let's get to know the candidates a little bit more. The former assistant DA Brooke Jenkins is currently in that seat after she was appointed by Mayor London Breed, and she is now running to keep that position. The news was announced by Pelosi herself on the House floor. She said it's time to make room for the next generation of Democratic leaders. And tonight, Cron 4's Dan Kerman reports on her announcement. Last night was a big deadline for Twitter employees. Elon Musk giving an ultimatum. Either pledge to, in his words, agree to extremely hardcore working conditions or resign with severance pay. Well, many chose the latter. At 10 o'clock on Thursday night, someone in San Francisco climbed atop an autonomous car to get down by shaking off their frustration. They were one of many people stuck behind the two self-driving cruise cars that stalled on a one-way street at Sacramento and Leavenworth. Behind them, a taxi and two buses. The bus is coming. 20 minutes later and a few blocks over, yet another driverless cruise car was captured inexplicably straddling two lanes mid-merge, stopping just inches away from the side of a muni bus over on Geary and Franklin Streets. Then another 20 minutes later, Cron 4's Dan Thorne and I found ourselves stuck behind another cruise vehicle with no one inside to help resolve the problem. This incident also on Sacramento Street, but at Mason, where a Line 1 bus was forced to sit idle on a hill beside the Fairmont Hotel before rerouting. Look at all of this space on the side of the road. For some reason, the vehicle did not have any capacity of pulling over into all that space. A phone number flashed on the screen inside, directing us to reach a technician because the self-driving feature was turned off. I don't, I don't know about not having anyone in those things yet, especially if they're coming to abrupt stops in the road in the middle of the night. Probably not the best. But by the time one arrived, laptop in hand, 20 minutes had already passed. The same amount of time, witnesses said, it took to clear the way at the first scene on Leavenworth. A cruise spokesperson responded to Cron 4 saying, safety is the guiding principle of everything we do. That means if our cars encounter a situation where they aren't able to safely proceed, they stop and turn on their hazard lights. And we either get them operating again or pick them up as quickly as possible. This could be because of a mechanical issue like a flat tire, a road condition, or a technical problem. We're working to minimize how often this happens. And they wouldn't really say how often it does happen. Uh, despite the disruption to muni buses, the city's transportation authority did not comment on the impact this, this had on their riders. They instead referred me to the California Public Utilities Commission that has regulatory authority over cruise cars, but that agency did not get back to us. And San Francisco Board Supervisor Aaron Peskin, who represents the areas where this all happened, only had this to say, not a good situation. Back to you, Catherine. The iconic Grace Cathedral in San Francisco is a piece of art in and of itself. But inside you'll find another impressive work of art, a 30-panel mural depicting historical events like the 1906 fire, which burned most of the city to the ground. Cathedral archivist Michael Lampin was acquainted with the Bolivian-born artist Antonio Sotomayor. A very urbane um, gentleman with a Bolivian accent, which he never lost. A very committed artist, and uh, I think his early years in Bolivia formed his art very strongly. The mural was masterfully painted with acrylic on linen in Sotomayor's home, just a stone's throw away on Knob Hill. The painter, sculptor, and illustrator immigrated to San Francisco in 1923. As a young man, Sotomayor got a job as a dishwasher at the historic Palace Hotel to make ends meet while attending the Hopkins Institute of Art. So the story goes, Antonio, on his fifth day as a dishwasher, dropped the dishes and instead left the kitchen. He took a seat in the lounge and sketched whatever came to his imagination. Well, his doodling caught the attention of his boss, who eventually helped launch him into San Francisco's high society art scene.
Two more of his murals are still proudly on display in the hotel's Pied Piper Lounge, portraying notable and eccentric characters, including literary luminaries Mark Twain and Bret Hart, as well as the self-proclaimed Emperor of the United States, Morton. His skills as a artist were soon found out by the owner, Janet Johnson, and she said, you are so good at drawing things. Could you do something for the palace? And that's what he did. He painted another painting that we have in our promenade for her to commemorate the 75th anniversary of the original hotel. Sotomayor went on to gain notoriety and was invited to serve as San Francisco Arts Commissioner in the 1940s and 50s. It's just a tribute to if you work hard and you have the right attitude, great things can happen. For many years, another sizable piece of his, which he is said to have described as the most challenging project of his career, was housed on Treasure Island. A terracotta sculpture 50 feet wide, titled The Fountain of the Pacific, created for the Golden Gate International Exhibition World's Fair in 1939. But the fountain symbolizing unity across the Pacific Ocean was broken up into smaller parts and has been tucked away out of sight for decades. Treasure Island Museum Vice President Anna Schnoblin has been captivated by its grandeur and symbolism since she laid eyes on it in 1991. She explains that Sotomayor made the fountain with the impression it would be on permanent display. Instead, its dissected parts lie in an abandoned hangar away from public view. So she continues on her mission to restore the fountain to its full glory. It seems like it's a per everything here is in a permanent state of disarray. I mean, when you see the island, the island is um, all torn up and covered with, with piles of dirt. And we know that eventually it's going to be a beautiful redevelopment. And I can certainly see why this fountain should be part of that redevelopment. Sotomayor came a long way from Chulamani, Bolivia. At the height of his career, his work was exhibited worldwide. He died of cancer at 82 years old in 1985. Sotomayor had no children but left behind artwork that will hopefully be enjoyed for generations to come. Reporting in San Francisco, I'm Ella Sigamonian. I personally love to educate people about history. San Francisco is so rich in so many stories. Of course, we, as we are making new ones today, there are so many that we should revisit from the past. And as I mentioned, Antonio didn't have any children, so I wonder if that played a factor, why we haven't heard of him more so today. So it was such a treat for me to come across his story and be able to share it with everyone. Makin Horshe. Makin Horshe, exactly. You all get it perfect. That is the sound so of a Native American language believed to have been long forgotten. Chechenya was archived in the 1920s by linguist John Peabody Harrington. He was the first known person to put the sounds on paper in written form with the help of this woman, Maria de los Angeles Colo, who was said to be one of the last fluent speakers. That's because two waves of colonizers infiltrated the northern California coast and forced indigenous people to abandon their way of living and speaking. First the Spanish in 1776, then the Mexican nearly one century later. Despite occupation, abuse, and suppression, these are not people of the past, but the present, who still flourish on their homeland, although called by a different name. Now known as Berkeley, that is where Vincent Medina and his partner Louis Trevino have been dedicating more than the last decade of their lives to reawakening the ways of their ancestors through both food and language. The duo is empowering their community by bringing back traditional Ohlone cuisine, like these quail eggs cooked with rosehip and elderberry at their restaurant, Makamham. Once linguistic students themselves at UC Berkeley, Medina and Trevino are now teaching weekly classes in Chechenyo and another of eight Ohlone languages called Rumsen. Every week we always feel, both this and I, we talk about this afterwards, regardless of like all the things that have been happening in the world, and what that can feel like. At the end of language class, you always just feel so warm and so satisfied and happy. We have a responsibility to those people that we come from to make sure that their sacrifices are never in vain, to make sure that we live up to those expectations that they have for us and that we make the future, we help make the future brighter for the generations that are coming. And the next generation has arrived, ready to learn alongside people of all ages who are meeting online for a 73rd consecutive week to study. Their student Karina Arellano felt compelled to connect with her roots, 
When expecting her firstborn son, he made his way into the world at the peak of the pandemic, so she named him a word in Chechenya, which means strength. For my ancestors, uh, the fact that our language hasn't been spoken fluently for so long, for us to be able to bring it back is huge. Such a big step to reclaiming our culture back. Their youngest pupil has been practicing newly learned words with her friends in fourth grade class. First, I came out to be just like a little kid, and now I'm a girl who's a part of this culture who can actually learn a ton of words in Chochenyo that you that not most people know. That's a part of what I do, and I feel proud of it. Another student explains that learning their language is a way to pay respect to their elders who endured danger they no longer face. Some people don't realize that some of our elders or our ancestors literally had the language beat out of them. And this is our way to make them proud by making sure that we keep our language alive. Medina explains reviving indigenous languages is rewarding because it connects them with an identity. Both educators say their efforts are repaid with a newfound sense of hope and a sign that the resilient East Bay Ohlone are alive and well. Truthfully, a brighter day is coming. First off, they acknowledge that California is home to 40 percent of Armenian Americans. Congresswoman Spear telling me that this was a very important trip to lift the spirits of the Armenian people and voice their support for the democratic country, which was just invaded by Azerbaijan. Armenians rallied in the streets of Yerevan as House Speaker Nancy Pelosi touched down in the capital city over the weekend. She was flanked by Bay Area representatives, Armenian Americans Anna Eshu and Jackie Speer, along with Representative Frank Pallone of New Jersey. Their visit came just days after Armenia accused neighboring Azerbaijan of launching an unprovoked attack in several Armenian provinces that killed more than 200 troops. We really want uh, us to figure out how exactly uh, U.S. people can help Armenian democracy. How can they arm our, us to help us to protect ourselves? Historically, Russia has pledged to protect the former Soviet country, but with the fight in Ukraine, help from Russia has been sporadic. Russia has been their guardian. Um, but they have shown uh, an unwillingness to come to their aid during this uh, most recent incursion. And there was a 44-day war in 2020. And, uh, we appreciate that. Prime Minister Nikol Pashinyan expressed like gratitude for the visit by high-ranking American government officials. Pelosi condemned the attacks by Azerbaijan and insisted the visit was all about human rights and respecting the dignity and worth of every person. We just had a very productive meeting during which our dialogue reaffirmed our commitment, the commitment of the United States Congress <clears throat> to advancing security, economic development, and democratic institutions in Armenia and in the region. In response, the Azerbaijani embassy released a statement in disapproval of the visit, calling it regrettable and saying in part, unfair accusations made by Nancy Pelosi against Azerbaijan are unacceptable. This is a serious blow to efforts to normalize relations between Armenia and Azerbaijan. Such unilateral steps and groundless statements serve not to strengthen the fragile peace in the region, but rather to escalate tension. Their disappointment doesn't come close to our disappointment in them for being the aggressor in the set of circumstances. Uh, we know full well that they were the ones that crossed over into Armenia, that they did not respect the borders. There have been um, over a uh, hundred soldiers and civilians who've been killed. They have dismembered soldiers' bodies and written horrific language on the torsos uh, one of which was a, uh, a woman a, who was a soldier. So uh, it's egregious conduct, and I think borders are not a war crime. So far, a ceasefire continues between Azerbaijan and Armenia. Congresswoman Speer says that help from the U.S. could be on its way, but she did not go into specifics on what that support could look like. In the newsroom, Ella Sugamonian, Quan4 News.